Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I hope you are keeping safe. Welcome to the Fidicare Committee webinar. Uh, today, we're delighted to be talking about diversity and inclusion in the engineering industry. And the webinar is organized by FIDIC Diversity and Inclusion Committee. I am really delighted to see quite a lot of people joining us today. I'm informed that we have close to 800 people registered from over 114 countries. Statistic is always about trying to aim for 50%. So if we're able to get 400, then we've done very well. Uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to be sort of uh, hosting this meeting this morning. And more important is really to go through why we're doing it. Diversity and inclusion is very important to FIDIC and to consulting in the engineering industry. Um, last year, we spent some time to look at the issue about COVID. And as a result of that, we effectively moved to the point where we deliver a number of webinars. Uh, over 18 webinars was run over 10 weeks. Uh, we had over 15,000 people that registered during the period and 9,000 people participated from 150 countries. And we had close to you know, 80 speakers, which I think was quite incredible within 10 weeks. But what has happened since then is we've had over 15,000 people now looking or watching a lot of our webinar on YouTube. So this webinar is going to be recorded, will be available on YouTube, and it's for the benefit of the consultancy and engineering industry. Now, last year, we focused purely on COVID. This year, we are doing three in one. We are focusing on our committee because we want to make them external facing. And today's committee is about diversity and inclusion. The last week one, we talked about membership and the benefit. In addition to that, we're going to do online issue to do with the state of the world, which is another webinar series that will come through. And finally, we do have the webinar series to pick up the theme from the COVID-19, which we are still very much in. So at this point in time, it's a great delight for me to invite and welcome our president, uh, Bill Howard, as usual, to give us an introduction welcoming speech. Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelson. And first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, the Secretariat, and our excellent speakers today for once again putting on a very timely uh, and very, very important uh, webinar. So thank you very much for that. I'd also like to thank the participants uh, from what I understand is over 100 countries uh, joining us today to listen in and uh, participate um, in this, again, very important program. Nelson mentioned that this is a series of uh, webinars that we're putting on. This one uh, is a continuation of webinars that focus on our various committees. Um, and we've put a lot of time in in the last two or three years um, synchronizing our committees and, and uh, making sure that they're, that they're all uh, lined up together and that we have the right committees. Uh, and in that connection, a diversity and inclusion group uh, is one that we formed relatively recently, and it's obviously incredibly important to us. Um, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to the presentations today um, from various experts um, in this important area. Um, and it's important to us for a whole variety of reasons. Um, <clears throat> perhaps the most important is that we need to um, to mirror, if you will, um, the, the people that we interact with. Uh, we need to look like them. We need to understand um, their, their issues and uh, it's from, a, from a diversity standpoint. Uh, there's a large population out there and we've got a lot of work to do in this particular area. It struck me well, when I had a board meeting, um, one of the first board meetings that we had in Geneva and I was sitting in our conference room and happened to glance up at the past presidents uh, of the FIDIC organization, the recent past presidents, maybe the last 10 or so. And uh, nine of the 10 looked just like me. Uh, the other one uh, was pretty, was a male. Uh, so um, it was just obvious looking at that wall, we've got work to do. Uh, we have made a little bit of progress. We want to make a lot more progress um, and perhaps one of the best areas of progress that we've been successful at is in our committees. If you, if you looked at um, the people running our committees, it's a very diverse group and thank goodness for that. But we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, and now just to close on a personal note, whenever I think of diversity and inclusion, I think back of my own personal career. 
And in ancient times, back in the 1990s, I actually chaired a committee on diversity and inclusion. Um, it's, we call it a diversity advisory committee at my firm, Camp Dresser McKee back then. And, uh, and I often looked at it as, uh, as, as quite an experience. I would love to have say that we made tremendous progress. I think the best I could say is we made some progress. But every once in a while, I'll meet someone uh, who was on that committee with me. We had a lot of younger people on. And one of the best comments I heard just recently uh, was from a young lady that said just the fact that they were sitting around our boardroom table talking about these issues was a, a tremendous benefit to her career. So uh, I have a lot of personal uh, interest in diversity and inclusion. I'm sure you all do. Uh, it's incredibly important. We've got a long way to go, but we're committed to making progress. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Nelson. Thank you very much, Bill, for that warm uh, introduction to the subject. I'm informed that we have over 800 people uh, registered. And I was just looking through the statistics. <clears throat> uh, the top 10 include people from India, uh, United Arab Emirates, United States of America, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, United Kingdom, Pakistan, Philippines, Qatar, Sri Lanka, Turkey, Egypt, and the list goes on. When you look through the list of people who register, I'm told quite a number of them are CEO. A lot of them are project manager, executive director. So which confirmed to me that this subject is absolutely, absolutely relevant. Now, Bill talked about diversity and inclusion. There used to be an old saying that diversity and inclusion, it is not about just an HR, it is business imperative. It's absolutely important that our industry reflect the society that we operate on. Last year, I saw the issue about Black Lives Matter, and that sent a wave in the industry. What FIDIC is aiming at and what FIDIC is progressing is that our industry should truly reflect. And that means that we've got to start from top through our board, through our committees, and we need to ensure that change is in place. So on that note, I'm really delighted to introduce you to your MC for the day, which is Michelle Kruger. She is the chair of the FIDIC Diversity, the first chair of the FIDIC Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, she's from South Africa. You can tell from her accent. We share a lot in common. We've traveled a lot together. And she's been with FIDIC for quite a while. She used to be involved with the future leaders. She's a lecturer with the leaders. And she does a lot with FIDIC. And I'm really delighted to introduce her hand over to Michelle. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nelson. And from my side, it's a huge honor to be the moderator today. I just want to also give credit to the fantastic committee members who work so hard to bring everything we can to diversity and inclusion for FIDIC. And what I'd like to do now is introduce our speakers. And again, thank you so much to the speakers. We are so honored to have you with us. Our first speaker, will be Charlotte Wuiswa McLean Ntlapo. She's from the World Bank and she's a global disability advisor. Second up, we'll have Katrina Taka, who is a co-creator and director of Cultivate Sponsorship. Then we'll have our board member, FIDIC board member, Catherine, Kar sorry, apologies, Karakatsanis, Chief Operating Officer at Morrison Hirschfield. And then lastly, we'll have Yust Marema, who is also on my committee and can I just say very proud of the work that that subcommittee is doing. But before we go to the speakers, we'll have our first poll and I please invite you to give your opinion on this poll. Uh, again, all the information that we gather here improves the work that we do as the committee. So we'll give you a couple of seconds. The first poll is diversity and inclusion is a topic that has nothing to do with the engineering industry a yes or no from yourself, we'd be happy to have your opinion there. While we wait for that answer, uh, just a bit about myself, I'm extremely passionate about diversity and inclusion. And obviously coming from a country as diverse as South Africa, I'm very proud to be chairing this committee. Okay, great stuff. So fantastic. Thank you so much for, for your uh, feedback on that poll. So first up, we'll have um, our speaker from the World Bank, Charlotte Wuiswa McLean and Klapu, Disability Advisor at the World Bank. 
Charlotte. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's really a great pleasure to join you today for this important discussion on ensuring diversity and inclusion in the engineering industry. I'd like to focus my remarks today on advancing equal opportunities and inclusive work environments for persons with disabilities in the engineering industry. And perhaps start off by noting that persons with disabilities make up 15% of the world's population, if not more. So in no ways is this an insignificant population group. Yet we all know that persons with disabilities are underrepresented in the science and engineering industries as compared with their proportion in the population. There's several reasons for this, and I'd like to highlight a couple of these during this session and offer some constructive strategies and actions that can be taken up by the industry. As I said, I will focus my remarks on persons with disabilities because far too many of them are not included in DNI initiatives that pertain in many sectors. Having persons with disabilities and different types of disabilities in your workforce ensures that you bring diverse life experiences and perspectives to your research and development cycle. Persons with disabilities need to be part of your entire product life cycles, starting from assessing market needs and gaps and project design, and not only brought in as testers and, and auditors, even though that process remains very important. The inclusion of this diverse population will undoubtedly increase the appeal the useful, usefulness and accessibility of your end product to a larger diverse market. And so doing, there's a need to be thoughtful and to be deliberate about the actions that are taken across the employment life cycle in order to advance fully the inclusion of persons with disabilities in science and engineering careers. And so what I'll do in my remaining time is to offer three buckets of actions that I hope you find useful. The first bucket, I would argue, is the pipeline to work. But in order for us to understand, in order for us to build the pipeline to work, we need to understand the pipeline and understand some of the challenges that it, it, it presents. For many persons with disabilities, inequities in education manifest into significant aspects of access and opportunity gaps in developing the skills and academic proficiencies later on in their life. And so there is a very strong correlation between access to education and then the actual pipeline. Often we see skills deficit in the area of digital literacy within this population. And I think this is one that really needs to be thought through uh, in, in terms of this industry. There is a lot the industry can do in terms of cultivating inclusive STEM, skill, uh, sk uh, building skills and opportunities for students with disabilities. Similar to programs trying to address the gender equity gaps in STEM, the industry can really consider programs that provide opportunities to students with disabilities, especially students who are at either secondary or tertiary level to really begin to hone in their STEM skills and drive the message that, that the engineering industry is an, an attractive career choice for all. And in so doing, it helps think through aspects around the intersectionality of, of diversity. The other aspect that could be considered in looking at the pipeline is offering internships and apprenticeships opportunities for children and youth with disabilities and again help them build the important interpersonal and ensure job ready readiness that really remains an important aspect of success successful hiring and employment experiences for example next time you consider having a hackathon or csr event focus on children and youth i urge you to make them accessible and to reach out to students with disabilities. The second bucket that I'd like to reference is the talent management bucket. 
And here and I would encourage the industry to think about their talent acquisition and management processes and assess whether these are open to and inclusive of persons with disabilities. It is important to be mindful of hiring and recruitment processes that may unintentionally become the barriers that keep persons with disabilities from stepping into the engineering careers. These can be in the form of job portals and application interfaces that are not designed to use accessibility standards and are impossible to use for persons using assistive technologies on their end. Or in a form of interviews where no one has asked the candidate for the need for reasonable accommodations. These can increasingly be a form of new hiring process that virtual or AI powered agents to screening resume, resumes or conduct initial hiring interviews. AI applications can end up mimicking the direct and indirect discrimination they face in society. For example, AI programs that screen resumes for job applicants can, can interpret disclosed disability as a negative characteristic if applicants with disabilities represented in the databases are frequently screened out at an early stage or stages. We need to learn from the recent lessons of AI recruitment programs that have discriminated based on race and gender due, due to past hiring patterns without understanding nuances of the societal biases and discrimination that they present. It is also important to understand that persons with disabilities are not a heterogeneous group and that the majority of persons with disabilities actually have invisible disabilities or disabilities that may man manifest through different body or facial gestures, which are negatively assessed by a virtual system. And so I would urge you to be conscious of these kind of inbuilt biases. My last bucket is around inclusive workplaces. And here I would like to say that it's important to start with the principles of non-discrimination and provision of barrier-free environments. And here, when we talk about bar barrier-free um, environments, we're talking about both the physical as well as the digital. Because once we have these, we can begin to pave the way for diversity, inclusion, and equity. There is an approach that we take in the broader field of disability inclusive international development called the twin track approach which might be a good strategy for the engineering industry to, to adopt. What that means is start by assuming and assuring that persons with disabilities can successfully apply for and work in all types of jobs available in your company. You don't have to start with the deficit focused questions such as what job is suitable for a person with XYZ type of disability. Rather, you start with the question, how can how can, you make a, how can you make different tasks accessible? In parallel, consider if there is a need for dedicated programs and resources to make work environments accessible to employees with disabilities. For example, having a centralized fund as we do at the World Bank to support assistive technologies and make accommodations readily available for staff with disability. That might include providing flexible schedules and creating disability inclusive affinity groups. One key aspect of the engineering industry is that your workforce needs to consistently evolve and upskill to upskill itself to keep pace with technologies and, adva and advancement. It is critical to ensure that these continued learning processes are also available to your employees with disabilities. I just want to close by saying that Research has shown us that the returns to the, to the business of a disability inclusive workplace in terms of employee satisfaction and productivity and retention outweighs the costs of making the accommodations. And so I really hope that some of these examples help you think through how to ensure that your industry becomes a lot more disability inclusive. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. And it's so interesting keeping in mind that what you've just spoken about pulls through to every aspect of diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Next up, we have Katrina from Cultivate Sponsorship, and she's going to tell us about a very interesting program that they're running 
uh, looking forward to that. Please go ahead. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning and good evening, everybody, from wherever you're coming in. Um, I'm in Australia, so um, it's quite late at night. I thought I'd just quickly set the scene and talk a little bit about what's happening um, in an Asia-Pacific context, specifically in Australia, given that we do have these 114 companies countries online this evening, um, and then touch on how we have found sponsorship to be um, quite a game changer in getting cut through an impact in some addressing some of those those um, very systemic issues that that both Bill and Charlotte touched on. Um, Australian organisations have been focused on diversity and inclusion for at least twenty years. It was at about that time that DNI organisations um, began to emerge. Banking and finance were the early adopters, along with some tech companies. Um, I have to say, unfortunately, that construction, infrastructure, and engineering were slower. Um, to take it up at that time, though they are probably racing ahead at the moment, I will say. Um, what we found was that we have had a highly siloed approach to DNI um, for a long time. So people tended to talk just about gender, just about people with a disability, just about LGBTI issues without recognising the person as a whole. And as I'm sure every single person on this call appreciates, you show up as your whole self with all of those elements of your identity coming to the table. So that has at times blocked the progress of the overarching holistic DNI agenda. Um, so I really applaud the approach Biddick is taking tonight in looking at all of the different characteristics and looking at DNI holistically, because I think that's quite representative of the current sort of human focus that is coming to DNI practice um, globally, globally and certainly in Australia. Um, having said all of that, I will focus on um, gender equality just in the interests of time. Um, and in this area, we have tended to do what um, exactly what Charlotte referred to a moment ago as that deficit-based approach. For many years, DNI practice, when it comes to gender equality, has focused on um, what are the problems that need to be fixed primarily with women, ironically. So it's almost been what I tend to talk about colloquially in Australia, a fix the women approach. You know, we've even had things like courses on how to um, speak with a deeper, lower voice so that you have are heard around the boardroom table. Um, I went in 2000, year 2000, I remember being at an IWD event and the advice that was given on International Women's Day to aspiring leaders by a very senior board member at the time was buy the best handbag you can possibly afford, always wear high heels and preferably wear pearls. And it's like, you know, seriously, people, what's that got to do with my leadership capabilities? So we have come a long way in our practice now because we have moved more towards an approach of understanding what are the cultural and systemic issues um, that have led to where we are today. In terms of the engineering industry specifically, um, we're in the, I guess, lucky position in Australia of having a $100 billion infrastructure budget at the moment that both the federal and state governments have signed up to as part of the um, road to recovery. However, um, this, is an, this has created an opportunity for a, very significant employment increases in those industries um, and yet most of the CEOs of companies of engineering firms of construction companies list as their number one risk factor the supply of skilled and unskilled labour. We have an enormous problem with getting enough people into the jobs that we need them to. Um, many countries, I'm sure, are grappling with the issue of STEM um, and getting enough kids to um, take up STEM subjects at school, um, and also that there is a big gender um, inequality in the representation of um, kids doing STEM subjects at both a high school level and at a more tertiary level. And in fact, this year in Australia, we saw a slight drop in the number of um, both boys and girls deciding to study STEM sub um, subjects. Um, even though we've been focusing on talking about this for ages, and that's where the future of employment is in Australia. Um, engineering has always been a male-dominated industry in Australia. We sit at about 15% representation um, of women. Why is this the case? Um, we know from research that um, girls, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, 
and also people from regional locations um, are less likely to feel as though they belong um, in a STEM subject and in a STEM based workforce. Um, and they don't sign up for the jobs or to study the subjects and therefore they're not available in that workforce. We also have a huge issue when it comes to retention. Um, Australia's engineering workforce really needs us to retain the qualified engineers that we have. And yet we know from government data that only 60% of the people who have an engineering qualification in Australia are actually working in an engineering role. We have an enormous leakage out of the pipeline of qualified engineers into other jobs and other careers, not just doing um, using their skills in a, um, in a related industry, they're actually leaving the industry. Um, what we also know is that women's participation um, rises from 20 to 30, and then between 30 to 45, it falls off a cliff and we lose women from jobs. So companies have invested considerable time by this stage in training up their um, people. Universities have trained up these wonderful students and then we they leak out of the workforce. So this is a big problem that needs to be fixed. Um, how do we change this? Um, I wish I could give you the magic solution, but I'll, I'll come close. Um, there is no um, possible change without assessing the systemic and cultural issues that have led to these factors. Um, you have to be aware of both. What are the, the um, cultural norms, the values, the behaviours, the mindsets that leads to a young girl thinking, I don't belong in an engineering course or I don't belong in an engineering firm? Um, then we have to have a look at within the organisations, what are some of the processes that are in place there that might not be progressing talent as quickly as um, you know, other people are. We know also from research that flexible work is an absolute must have, not only for women, um, in fact, I'd say not for women, for men, um, which leads me to how we um, came to form Cultivate Sponsorship. My um, business partner is a leading Australian um, academic. Her um, PhD research has been into the um, barriers in, in male dominated industries, specifically construction engineering firms. Um, and her research showed that there was significant mental health pressures on both men, particularly men and women from the um, culture in those um, industries and in those roles. And that was um, causing that drop off in that 30 to 45 year age bracket. Um, secondly, that there were um, informal express lanes through career progression that were available to people in organisations and they tended to be available to people who um, like the like. So senior men tended to more actively engage in, take an interest in um, the careers of younger men and sponsor them informally by virtue of the relationship, the sharing of the networks and the relationships. It's not an intentional thing, it's, it's a function of human behaviour. Um, so we know that if we want to change that leakage of talent from the pipeline, particularly in those critical mid-level years, you have to keep people in the organisation. Um, so we've built a sponsorship program which um, aims to do that because it's functioning not at that deficit base level. It's not about here's a couple of skills and we you know, hope that, that you're going to be a better person. We're actually working with the organisation to figure out what are the processes that exist within the organisation, what are some of the unknown things that people do that tend to accelerate the career opportunities of some people and not everyone. Sponsorship um, is a very different concept to mentoring, um, or maybe I shouldn't say very different, it is different. Most people are familiar with mentoring. Um, that person usually in your career is an advisor or a whereas a sponsor takes a much more active role. We call it a strategic alliance and they're much more of an advocate in that person's career and that's why it works. Um, when people do a sponsorship program, it's not just the female that's on the program, the leader and the young, young talented person are both on the program. And what we have found resoundingly is that the leaders on the program get so much out of it and they develop invaluable insights into the um, career experiences 
of the person that they're sponsoring. Plus they then take an active interest in their career and they will start to advocate for them. And that's why it's highly impactful. Um, of course, industry organisations like FIDIC and um, you know, other organisations, there's still a lot of work to be done to make change at an industry wide level. But this is something very powerful that companies can do, organisations can do um, within their own environment, because it's about creating those different relationships within the organisation. Um, and I'm very happy to say that Consult Australia, so FIDIC member was one of our first um, organisations that we worked with, and a number of um, Australian multinational engineering firms have completed it, such as ACOM, SMEC, GHD, Jacobs, to name a couple. Um, and just to share in closing, so I know I'm just about to hit my 10 minutes, um, for example, the CEO of one of those major engineering firms, um, he stated in his sort of closeout session, this had a profound impact on me because I'm seeing the world through my sponsee's eyes. I'm starting to see that there are gender stereotypes and there's still an emphasis on input. For example, the long hours characterised by our, by our sector rather than focusing on output which is really important. We need to change this. We've got a long way to go. That's what the CEO got out of being a sponsor on this program. The women, on the other hand, have said that they learn about the importance of connections and networking, and they are pushed outside of their day-to-day -day activities, and they grow beyond the technical skills because most people focus on their technical skills. So that just gives you a snapshot of um, why we have found that sponsorship is highly effective um, as one of the levers that you pull in your toolkit of DNI strategies. It's not the silver bullet, uh, but it's definitely one of the more impactful ones because it works at a workplace culture as well as a systemic level. Um, and it achieves change in both of those um, in a lasting way, not just a programmatic way. Um, I'll leave it there, but very happy to take questions later on. Thank you so much, Katrina. Uh, once again, a fantastic presentation. And I, I'm sure there's lots of questions uh, that will come to you afterwards. Before we go to our next speaker, we're going to have our second poll. So uh, if the team can please put up the poll. While we're waiting for the poll, and, uh, and I please urge you to, to respond to the poll, it, it gives us a lot of good information from FIDIC side in making sure that the work that we're doing as a committee is in the correct direction. So the poll give us the question for global FIDIC approach. FIDIC should formulate a very clear and specific set of guidelines that should be implemented. So you can choose all the way from not agreeing to agree. And then the next question for global FIDIC approach, uh, FIDIC should leave it up to the regions because such a broad topic should not be addressed globally. So once again, there you able to choose how you how much you agree and disagree. And then the third question is for a global FIDIC approach. FIDIC should focus on gender equality because it's far more important than other diversity and inclusion issues. So again, please, if you can tell us how much you agree or not agree to that statement. And this will guide us in our approach. Uh, from, from FIDIC side, what we're trying to do and coming back to what Katrina was talking about, it's very important to know what currently is being done in the diversity and inclusion space so that we can learn from each other, learn from others' successes and failures. I, I'm always a proponent to, to talk about even my own failures because that's the way life is. I'm, I'm going to make mistakes. Please learn from my mistakes and then you make your mistakes. And when it comes to diversity and inclusion programs, oftentimes people can be quite negative about the programs. But again, in any failure, there is the opportunity to grow. So thanks again for giving us your responses. Okay, we have very good feedback there. Thank you so much. So overall for question one, we have agreement. For question two, it's quite split. Very interesting. And then for question three, again. Okay, our next speaker, I'm very honored to say she's, uh, um, Catherine represents us on the free as well, and very honored to have her and James representation on the board. 
Um, as you know now, Catherine's also COO with everything that comes with that. So Catherine, we look forward to listening to you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Well, um, as you mentioned, Michelle, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Morrison Hirschfeld. I'm also a structural engineer. And Morrison Hirschfeld is a diversified employee owned uh, consulting engineering firm. We have 23 offices in Canada and the US, uh, with one in India and we have over a thousand staff. I started at Morrison Hirschfield after graduation and so I've been there ever since, starting out as a structural engineer and I've moved through various technical management positions to where I am today. So I'm joining you all from Toronto, Canada. As Michelle mentioned, I'm also a member of the FIDIC board and the board liaison for the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. So I've got to uh, enjoy uh, working with all the committee members and they're doing a great job. I'm very happy to have been invited to speak today on this very important and relevant topic. I'm going to provide a perspective from my vantage point and let you know how our firm is approaching the diversity and inclusion uh, issues. Now, this past year has been a difficult one for all of us. The entire world has been dealing with the devastating pandemic, but this year has also brought significant and appropriate attention to the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter are full of posts on very diversity and inclusion topics. And for the first time ever, social media platforms have taken steps to ban users for unacceptable speech. Rightfully, the need for attention to diversity and inclusion has become, if it was not already, an important component in our daily reality. Despite what we've accomplished so far, our firms really clearly have not even done remotely enough. The current social climate is making all of us reassess not only our words of commitment and intention, but also our actions. This is a reality that's necessary, warranted, and is also being driven by our employees and our clients. Research and business cases have been made that diverse and inclusive teams outperform their peers, but the importance of diversity and inclusion, I believe, go beyond that. It's a matter of cherishing and including everyone. It's about creating a work environment that is welcoming to all, an environment that allows everyone to feel valued and to perform at their best. My firm has tried to do the right thing, but we are also assessing our intentions and actions. It's diversity and inclusion is integrated in our newly minted five-year strategic plan we believe diversity and inclusion is an essential part of our culture. Our executive team has recently updated our diversity and inclusion policy, and we've created a plan, which includes the creation of the Diversity and Inclusive Advisory Council. One of the first actions the council will do is to review that plan. The council is comprised of a dozen passionate volunteers in our firm, that's large enough to form a diversified group. I will be co-chairing the council with our Vice President of Human Resources and our, and our first meeting is planned in a couple of weeks. The creation of the council is an important component of Morrison Hirschfield's overall DNI strategy. And its, role, and its role is to recommend how to further embed diversity and inclusion into our culture and insist the, the advisory council co-chairs, myself and our VPHR, in executing the DNI strategy in our firm. Let me share some of the current uh, demographic statistics of our firm. And keep in mind that research shows that you need a minimum of 30% to influence and drive change. 36% of our employees are ethnic or visible minorities. 40% of our board of directors are female. 25% of our leaders are female. 
In Canada and US, only about 13% of professional engineers are female. So uh, we have about 18% female, which is above the national average. I've been in senior management in our firm for quite some time, and I've been on the board of directors for the last 17 years. And clearly I'm part of the gender minority in our industry and also in our firm. In my role as an executive and on the board for many years, I was the only female. I was our first female shareholder in 75 year history and our first female executive. And thankfully, I've been able to provide a different perspective. One I believe that has helped enlighten our firm on issues of diversity and inclusion. But as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot more to do. So I'm gonna share some of the activities briefly that we're, we are doing. Perhaps that would be helpful to some of the other firms that are listening in. In addition to the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Council, we aspire to continue to improve on the metrics I shared with you earlier and to build on and improve our existing diversity initiatives. We've signed on to a Canadian-wide goal of having 30% of professional engineers obtaining licenses in 2030 to be female. Currently, it's only half that in Canada and the US. This will involve adopting best practices and regular reporting on our advancement towards that goal. We've delivered uh, training to senior management on gender intelligence and are ready to train our department managers next. We've hosted industry breakfasts on this topic and many have said it's one of the most impactful training sessions they've ever participated in. We have mandatory respect in the workplace training that deals with unconscious bias, prejudice, and discrimination. All new hires have to take this, and we've been doing that for over a decade. We had an external consultant review all our policies for bias a few years ago, and we made necessary changes. We've created a structure and management training on best hiring practices focused on raising awareness on unconscious bias, even in so far as how we advertise our positions. We've reviewed our benefits program with a diversity lens, and this resulted to changes in some of our policies, including our vacation policy. We added in maternity leave top up, enhanced our mental wellness benefits, and expanded our flexible work arrangements. We recently completed an internal pay equity review for systemic bias, and we conduct regular confidential staff surveys to monitor well being and diversity. Last month, our result uh, showed that 83% of our staff believe that our firm offers a diverse and inclusive culture. In a couple of weeks, we're hosting uh, a, a lunch mentoring session on International Women's Day. There's some of what we're doing. So really, I think the best way to make change is first to acknowledge that it's required. Talk about the issues openly and candidly. It's only by talking about these issues that firms can begin to do what's necessary to address them. Engineering is essential in securing society's health, safety, and economic prosperity. And to do this effectively, the engineering profession must include the greatest possible range of knowledge, skills, experience, and perspectives. In order to actively engage the best minds in the profession, we need to ensure a strong core of potentially different views and ways of thinking, which means ensuring that our industry reflects society. Everyone will prosper as a result. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I just want to pick up on something you've just spoken about. It brings prosperity. Uh, basically, the research shows that the more diverse your team, and it's not just gender, it's across the board, the higher your revenue and the better your cash flow. So if that's not a good enough reason 
to, to improve diversity and inclusion in your company, I don't know what is. Next up, we have Joost Marima. He's a, a committee member, as I've mentioned before, and he's been spearheading, uh, putting together the FIDIC diversity and inclusion policy document. Joost? Hello, everybody. I'm uh, calling from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, my name is Joost Marima. And I will be uh, talking you through the process we, uh, we went through in uh, drafting a FIDIC policy on the topic of diversity and inclusion. Um, first of all, um, I'm, I'm uh, with a company, we deliver project management services and my main focus in doing so is that we try to work on collaboration and involvement. And I think that shines a bit through in, in the perspective we, uh, we as a team uh, delivered in the draft uh, policy. Of course, uh, being it a draft policy, we are uh, also very uh, looking for some, some input as we did with the questionnaires about getting it right, of course, for such an important uh, topic. So the subtitle of the, uh, of the FIDIC draft policy is about embracing differences and to treat each other equal. So it's embrace differences, treat equal. I think this is a um, really important point that um, uh, most of the time we try to, to dissolve uh, differences uh, and to consider everybody equal, but that's not the case. However, we should treat each other equal. I think this is very important. And this is also not something we invented, of course, but it's in Article 1 of the UN uh, Declarations of the Human Rights, saying that um, the fundamental freedoms go uh, for us without distinctions as to race, sex, language, or religion. So I think that's, uh, that's where we, we, we picked up on, on the topic where should we start? Well, it's, it's already there. Um, having such a policy on this, on this topic, it's also to, to, to consider what state uh, the, the world is in. And uh, of course, the, 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 um, the thing about, for example, sustainability, um, we all have uh, thoughts going towards nature, of course, obvious, and, and depletion of national resources. But it's, as uh, our chair already mentioned, it's, uh, and, this, and the speakers before me, it's also about prof profit. It's not only planet, it's not only profit, but it's also about the people, us. And um, when you look into it, the, the Club of Rome recently uh, disclosed their, uh, their paper on the topic and describing that actually it's about the well-being of people. And we see a lot of... Um, um, good things happening there. Uh, but we also, as a FIDIC policy group, see a lot of low-hanging fruit to deliver more on the part of well-being. So how can we contribute to the well-being of people? Uh, I think that sets uh, about the state of why do we need a FIDIC policy? And I was very happy to see in the questionnaire that more than 90% of you uh, confirmed that uh, we're not just engineers doing engineers' job or an engineering consultancy uh, sector. We're also just people trying to deliver the world of tomorrow by making, uh, delivering our projects, of course. So the FIDIC has an ambition to build a strong and sustainable uh, global association based on core values being integrity, sustainability, and quality. Uh, so it, it fits very nice well together about well-being, people, planet, profit. Um, and what we did in our FIDIC policy, of, of course, we started with definitions and we uh, connected them to the definitions already in place by the UN or uh, um, WGHO and, and organizations like that, because we found it immediately very important that we started to uh, use the right vocabulary uh, when, when addressing the topic of diversity and inclusion. Um, secondly, we, we discussed and thought about the mechanisms. So I'm going to get a little bit technical here, but um, as you saw in the results of the, uh, of the questions already, it's very, um, it's very uh, challenging to, to, to make a policy around a topic that uh, really is based on the idea of inclusion. So making choices without leaving people out 
that that's that that should be one of the main things about a FIDIC policy regarding uh, diversity and inclusion. And I think we 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 took uh, three approaches to it, and they come together in the policy. And I, let me try to explain that. So the mechanics of the of the policy is to uh, define main themes, to address uh, focus points on that, and let them come together on three levels. And I'm starting with the three levels and I will derive from that. So first of all, uh, talking about topics like this, and I think uh, a lot of the introduction your speakers also took us, um, gave us an insight on the, on the path they, they took. I think it starts with looking in the mirror actually. So the FIDIC policy is not firstly, but one of the three uh, perspectives is that it's focusing on the FIDIC organization itself. So to speak, it's about practicing what you preach. Um, in this way, uh, you will be able to lead and inspire others to do the same. The second thing is that we saw um, that the topic of DNI is regionally more or less different. So it's, it's a topic globally, but it looks different on def different regions. Uh, we suggest it would be smart to try to collectively raise the bar on the topic while leaving room for regional um, um, focus, as you, uh, as you can understand. In that way, you start working on the, on the idea that you could involve uh, people on a, on a regional level. And then I come to the th third perspective. I think it's about delivering the promises we make on our projects. As, uh, as the saying goes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So we consider it uh, a must have to be able to show what do we deliver on the topic of DNI in our projects. That's, that's, that's where it should be uh, visible, at least. And I think Michelle already um, uh, sh uh, shared with us the, the, the point that a lot of research shows if you have a broad spectrum. Um, and uh, if you uh, tap into these potential reservoirs of knowledge, people and commitment and competences, you will end up having better products, uh, reaching higher quality, but also it's better for business. However, personally, I don't think it's, it should be that the main focus, but it's, it surely helps, of course. Um, the second thing is I, I told, talked about the, uh, the themes, and this was a very, also a very important discussion about which themes do we choose from, from the long list of where people treat each other uh, not equal and where do we create differences? And the list is endless. So when you draft a policy like this, you have to make choices and the, and the main choice we made is that we wouldn't want to make a dni policy which is a single issue policy um, from all the points we we discussed we chose three and that's to say that the other points or the other themes are not important but the basic idea is that if we are able to make a difference on these three themes it surely would help on other themes that are so well important because it's something about evolving and uh, uh, growing, so to speak. So the three themes are what we, we address is gender equality, which has been spoken of already, but also the ethnic aspects. So in the introductionary um, talk, um, the uh, uh, all kinds of, 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 of uh, uh, insights come to us now and uh, for, uh, for example, of obvious, the Black Lives Matters movement, the ethnic aspect should be addressed. And thirdly, we see re uh, religious aspects as one of the three things we should focus on. Those are the three themes uh, within the FIDIC policy, but I really want to address that it's about the, the basic idea is that if we start moving on these three topics, we're, we're at least moving in the right direction. And in other uh, themes should be uh, should be taken with that in that movement, if you know what I'm getting at. The the third part is that we so we have the mechanisms about the three levels of of um, looking to the mirror, collective evaluation bar, but do it regionally, and also delivering the promises on the projects. 
We have the three themes being gender equality, ethnic aspects, and religious aspects. And lastly, in the policy, we described that uh, the way to approach it uh, and to maybe start uh, uh, measuring it is that we have five focus points. And within such a focus point, you can address those three themes within a DNI policy. So the first is about education and diversity of staff and skills. Uh, all things can happen, of course, there, but it's about quotas, but measuring and see what kind of ratios we're working with um, and how to uh, lower bars for people to actually uh, contribute to that. So the secondly, uh, the, uh, the idea is that we should be engaging in more diverse uh, groups, uh, be in committees or be in work groups, be in project teams. It's, uh, I think this is more about the practice of involving. Um, uh, involving also in the third item is about obviously employment. And with employment, you can think about the, um, the career paths we draw in our organizations or the, the, the abilities we give people to with disabilities uh, or the ability how, uh, to, to give a, 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 a maybe a, 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 a mother of three the same opportunities as a father of three. So that's about the employment uh, thing. The fourth uh, theme, uh, or for, focus point, excuse me, is about social return on investment. And social return on investment could be very well something um, we can use to uh, award contracts. Um, here in the, in the EU, uh, especially in the Netherlands, we have a good standing practice of using uh, quality criteria to award projects where we use uh, social return on investment. Um, so we, we, we give benefits to the companies really showing that they make progress on that, that part. And the last one, but not least, is about social behavior. It's already mentioned. It's about how we treat each other, actually treat each other, how we work together in project teams. Um, we think that the focus point of social behavior, yeah, behavior it's also about creating a safe environment, working environment, also in the project teams and giving space to uh, people um, to, to express uh, their ideas. Because if, if we really truly are serious about uh, involving everybody, we should definitely be uh, involving them actually and uh, lowering any bars or limited, limits present for any contribution whatsoever. So that pretty much sums up the basic ideas and the, the mechanisms of the, the FIDIC policy. And, and let me end by saying that such a policy should be a starting point, obvious. Not only a, a starting point to work from and, uh, and delivering a, a, more, a world with, uh, with more room and space for D&I, but of also a, a world where we can uh, evolve on the matter. So I would like to end with the of course, the, the subtitle of embracing difference and treat each other equal, but also give, to give you an idea that the way we do that is by involving, and by involving, we could be evolving. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joost. And I just want to support uh, the end of Joost's speech there to just remind the audience that the pillars of FIDIC are sustainability, integrity, and quality. So if you look at those three pillars, um, diversity and inclusion becomes very obvious. And to support that, we will be updating the FIDIC guide to practice to, to include diversity and inclusion. And from there, that will do the FIDIC Future Leaders Management Certificate. Um, so I'm very excited to mention that as well. Before we move on to our questions, we'll just quickly have our last poll. So if the organizer can please bring it up, thank you. A FIDIC policy can only be effective when you leave room for local or regional focus. So again, you would have noticed you just mentioning regional, local, um, and to support you in this manner, we need to have your opinion, please. If you can give us a guide how much you agree and how much you disagree. And again, thank you so much to all of the speakers before we move on. Uh, I've also noticed there are quite a few questions in the chat. Uh, 
with your permission and for me taking advantage as moderator, I'll be posing some of my own questions as well to, to the speakers. Great. So overall, we have a majority agreeing. Thank you so much for that feedback. Okay, coming to, to the Q&A. Um, for Charlotte, are there examples of good hiring programs and practices for persons with disabilities within the engineering industry? Charlotte? Thank you very much, Michelle, for a great question. So just to say that, you know, there are a number of tech companies um, and the, a few that come to mind are Microsoft, Google, et cetera, that have actually developed initiatives to increase uh, persons with disabilities in their workforce. Uh, and they've done this by, by including internship programs. Uh, for example, there's a very successful initiative to hire uh, persons who, who have autism and they have been put into high paying tech jobs. And I do wanna underscore that, the, the piece around high paying jobs, because if we're really serious about diversity, inclusion and equity, we need to make sure that when we are diversifying our, our workplaces and spaces, that we're ensuring that people can have high, pay, uh, high paying jobs as well. And that we don't cluster persons with disabilities or women in jobs that that are are, are low low paying, um, and I think you know we're beginning to see a lot more um, hiring of persons with disabilities in 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 employment, and we're also seeing that um, in a number of countries uh, there are state it, there are um, quota systems in place, uh, and these you know there there's a mixed there's a mixed uh, bag in terms of how effective they are, but it is helpful to begin to develop indicators, disability indicators into your own diversity and inclusion matrix, because that then helps you think about how this, you know, how, how well you're doing um, as, as an outfit yourself. Um, and then I think it's really important, as I mentioned in, in, my, in my early uh, remarks, to think about how to build that pipeline and invest in that to then ensure that you do have a pool from which you can hire. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charlotte. My next, next question to Katrina. Uh, you have a fantastic program on mentorship that you're running in Australia. How best can we expand your program into the rest of the world? Uh, great question, particularly for this sort of an audience. Um, because it is built online, um, it is built to be uh, sort of completed anywhere in the world. And in actual fact, what we discovered was during the um, during COVID and the lockdown, uh, the early companies who came to start their program used it to overcome some of those geographic and even national barriers. It was a very effective way of keeping people in touch. Um, so we have found that it's working in across regions and across global locations very well. Um, and we have the ability to translate the content if that's necessary into other languages. But it's actually a very effective form of connecting people. And some of the feedback we've had is where you have um, larger dominant offices, it actually, in, in sort of different areas, it's a very effective way of um, connecting some people who might be in a smaller office and putting them on the horizon so that they're visible and that talent is really surfaced and they become obvious. So um, it's perfectly set up for global application and in that way, quite useful for multinational companies. Thank you, Katrina. And obviously one of the biggest benefits of uh, lockdown is having platforms like these, Zoom, Microsoft Teams yes. and so on. And I must say, I'm, I'm enjoying this aspect quite a bit. Uh, then for Catherine, how has the recent social unrest and heightened focus on awareness on diversity and inclusion change the expectation and the Yeah, Michelle, uh, actually we've noticed uh, a real heightened focus from our clients uh, about this. And a lot of the proposal requirements include us reporting on what we're doing about uh, corporate social responsibility, diversity, and inclusion. Um, they're requesting to see our policies, our commitment statements, 
They're asking about our plans for diversity and inclusion. Um, in some cases, they want to know what our, our metrics are, our demographics. And even the teams that we put on the projects, they are evaluating them. Uh, so uh, if they don't see enough diversity, and in, uh, then they will actually um, point it out to you or else not award you the project. Uh, I've participated in um, you know, interviews with major uh, clients uh, where they have specifically asked me, you know, what, what are we doing and asked me for our survey results and, and what, what do our staff think about what we're doing? So it's become quite prevalent on major projects for both uh, public and our private clients, which I think is a good thing. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. So also comes back to what you was talking about, the social return on investment and clients are becoming very aware. Thank you so much. So I'm going to throw this the next question at used. How can governments help contractors best retain qualified engineers? Used? Yeah, sure. Um, well, obviously, if you hire somebody to do a job, it should be firstly of all about qualif qualifications you need for that job. But I think it's already explained that it's about uh, how do get how do people get into a job? What what is the process for them to actually reach that that point? And uh, reaching that point, I think it's also about how are they uh, able to uh, to do the work properly in a in a in a in a, in a safe and um, uh, open environment. Uh, so, for example, um, so another point being made about what kind of difference you can think about with aspect to uh, uh, religious aspects. Well, it's it's also about um, uh, the attitude towards it, of course, but also in a, on a more practical level that uh, different peoples from different religions need, need have different needs in terms of taking time off or having their uh, holidays. And I would add to that, it's also about how other people react to that, that, that's, that, they're, that, that's, that their needs are. Um, secondly, also, I think it's, uh, it's a good thing to stress that it's also trying to avoid overreacting on, on topics like this, because an overreaction tends to polarize and polarization stands in the way of, you know, getting along with each other towards a good movement. So I think this is a, this is one of the nice examples that when you talk about qualification of personnel and, and people, it's about how they reach it, but also how we tend to leave room for them to, uh, to deliver. Michelle, I think the way it's in for you. Shared there. Right. Okay. Um, I suspect we may probably have lost Michelle. I'm just going to try and step in for a minute there, eh, as we probably have you. Um, the question I was going to put across into probably to Catherine uh, before I start taking questions from the floor is Catherine, you demonstrated a good example of what your company are doing. And it's actually intriguing to see that you are the first, you know, female to be a shareholder in the company. Uh, can you share with us some of the challenges to try and encourage leadership rather than at the grassroots level, but actually encouraging more people at leadership level? Katrin? Okay. Um, thank you for, for that question. And um, yeah, I, I, I really did uh, a, a lot of what um, Katrina described uh, resonated with me when it comes to females in, in the profession. Uh, she's quite right, you know, half of, half of them leave in their 30s. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, considering the, the skill shortage that we have, that's a shame. And um, you know, we talk about women a lot, but a lot, a lot of the same challenges are shared by minorities as well. Uh, so when we address that issue, I think we're also addressing the minority issue. Uh, so a lot of, I think, um, what's required is for um, companies 
to actually go out of their way to look for qualified women and minorities and bring them on. Uh, so, I mean, you don't even need quotas. You just need to look hard for those that are existing. And I think that stati you know, statistics can be a crutch. Um, uh, so we don't have to lean on that. But um, the, the consulting engineering environment is not that welcoming. It is predominantly uh, sort of a macho environment. So I think it is important, as I said in my opening remarks, that we recognize that and, and do something about it. Uh, and, and so for someone like myself, you know, I had to, I think, you know, uh, work very hard, prove myself, but also, you know, not take things personally. Um, everyone has challenges, regardless of whether you're a female or, or male. And so, you know, um, address those challenges, work hard, look for mentors to help you and share with, you know, be your authentic self. And when Katrina said, you know, lower your voice or do this or do that, you know, none of that is appropriate. In fact, I remember being a young female engineer going on the construction site in my, you know, um, uh, you know, dress with my construction boots and hard hat. And I was very accepted even many years ago. So I hope that answers some of what you've asked, Nelson. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, Katrin. There's a question from the floor now. I believe uh, from a lady called Vivian Walters. Uh, it says some engineering organization advertising their diversity credentials uh, and yet still continue discriminating practice that break the country's law. They rely on cover that engage legal support and most of what can be done. So a lot of company, they, they sort of show off their statistics uh, and, and I think you know it's good to see that statistic being captured and being played back. But actually, when it comes to employment, there's a lot of barriers to making it happen. So, Katrina, you know, what's your take on that? I mean, bear in mind what you guys are doing in Australia. Yeah. Mm. I, I wish I could say that doesn't happen in Australia, but we certainly do um, see the same examples. I think that goes back to uh, workplace culture and why you have to focus on it because. You can have policy statements all you want and media and advertising, but if you don't deal with the fundamental values of an organisation, if you don't focus on the fundamental behavioural expectations and really live by those and take um, decisive action, then you'll see behaviours that look completely contrary to everything that you're saying. So it could be that the company meant those positive statements but then you get somebody who behaves um, counter to that and it does all the hard work that the organisation has put in. It's a classic reason why when companies don't take action on bad behaviour, um, it's incredibly risky in terms of brand damage. So I think the solution to that is that a company, if it's going to commit to diversity and inclusion, it has to be leader led, it has to be role modelled um, and you have to see the role modelling from the top down. Um, it, it's not a bottom up. I'm a big fan of bottom up strategies, but this is one where it has to be role modeled from the top down. And if you see anything that doesn't live and breathe the values, you have to deal with it. And you can't stand for something that's contrary to what you have just articulated to be something you believe in. Thank you very much, Katrina. Uh, the other question that comes through, I'm going to put this across to Josh. And I think the question goes within the plan that policy that you're developing for FIDIC, the question goes from a gentleman called Hugh Zagzi. Is there, are there any framework or models developed by FIDIC or other organizations to measure or assess the diversity in engineering consultants in the industry? Is there any template, you know, just that we can reference to, or are we planning to look at that as part of the policy where you can measure the diversity in a company? Uh, just for- Yeah, yeah, sure. If you, if you permit to start off with a little joke that it's it's a common theme for engineers to, to try to start measuring things uh, to see where we're heading at. Uh, but then again, uh, it really helps to make it ex explicit what, what we actually uh, are trying to achieve. So yes, that's definitely one of the things where we're looking at. And the way uh, we are thinking about it to look at is not only by uh, putting out just uh, blunt quotas or KPIs or stuff like that, uh, 
uh, as I already mentioned. Um, the, the idea is that we, um, we have to be a little bit smarter about it. Um, uh, that being said, it should be something more about uh, along the line of the focus points and see what we can measure uh, about employment and conditions and engaging of the diverse groups. Uh, and also, of course, say uh, uh, social behavior and the way this topic is, is, is um, um, uh, uh, taken in by the leadership programs, the trainings, but also eventually uh, probably something in, the, in, in, in contracts or, or stuff like that. So, yes, we will work on that. It's not an easy thing to do. And we will definitely start the di uh, dialogue with uh, the regions about this, because I can really imagine that probably different regions have different needs in terms of what they want to measure and how they're going to measure it. Well, thank you very much for that. I mean, I do remember in stating your mechanics earlier, you talked about one of the pillars to look at is making sure that projects are being delivered with diversity. One of the questions from this floor is about how would DNI topics be addressed in future PD contract or yellow or silver book? I mean, I'm not quite sure whether any of you guys are very much in the contract sense, but I do hear the statement in everything that has been said that is not just purely at the corporate set, but also on the point of project delivery or even specifying the whole process. And I just wonder, perhaps, if I can bring Bill, you know, do you have any thoughts? How do you think DNI can be put into PD contract? in such a way that when it comes to project execution, there's a requirement, as Catherine said, where some clients are asking deliberately, what is the statistic on project by project basis? Bill. Uh, thank you, Nelson. That is a, it's a great question and I'm not sure the answers are that simple, but uh, let me just describe what I think is going on now. Um, and as some of the speakers mentioned, more and more clients, um, whether private sector or municipal or whatever, but more and more clients are demanding uh, to see the, the makeup of the staff uh, of the entire company, uh, as well as the makeup of the staff of the team. So I think that as a profession, we've been in a reactive mode. We support, uh, actively support clients asking those questions and and most uh, successful firms are striving to make themselves look as diverse as they possibly can. So I think there's a lot of activity in that area. Now, to answer the question about contracts, I think we're on a little bit of a difficult slope there because um, I would, I don't, at this point in the year 2021, I would be concerned about FIDIC putting requirements into a contract that's supposed to um, apply to the entire world uh, that deals with things like diversity. Uh, I have the, by the way, I have the same concern about sustainability. Um, not that we are against sustainability, we're certainly not quite the opposite, but, but we, we want to be very careful about putting in our contracts the kinds of things that the owners and the countries uh, and the agencies uh, pretty much reserve for themselves. Having said all of that, I think uh, at some point in time uh, in the future, uh, it very well may be that we'll be putting more in there. So now the final point I would make is that is a great question for the diversity and inclusion uh, council to kick around and give us some uh, some feedback uh, book, uh, feedback on, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for that. Bill, I mean, uh, I know for sure there's a question here which is addressed to Catherine. And as the board member responsible for diversity and inclusion, uh, I know you're going to say this is a great question and I will rephrase it. In the history of FIDIC of 105, I understand you are the third female board member. The question is, how can we improve that number of female within the FIDIC board? I know Bill is all for it. And more important, when are we gonna get the first female president? This is a question for you, Catherine, and for Bill. And I know Bill is very passionate about it, you know, so I'm gonna put it to you, Catherine. I can't avoid it. You have to answer that question. When are we all gonna right. get <laughs> and when are we gonna get the first female president? Oh, okay. Well, um, I am very honored to, to be a, a board member and I'm also chair of the nominating committee. 
And uh, the board has uh, made a, um, I guess, a, you know, an, um, a goal that we have 50% uh, of our board being female within the next few years. So it's a, an excellent goal. And the most recent letter we sent out to our members have uh, stated that when asking for their consideration in uh, nominating members for the board this year. So again, I think it is about looking for qualified female candidates. Uh, so we do have that aspirational goal of having 50%. And I'm sure that we will have a female uh, president of FIDIC in uh, the near future. Thank you very much for that, we Bill. Um, I that. Well, I have, I'll let go of that. I have no doubt that's gonna happen. And well, one of the many benefits of this crazy time we're in, as I mentioned right at the beginning, is we have uh, we have heard from over 9,000 people around the world uh, in these webinars. But particularly, um, I have been uh, exposed as speakers and presenters of a number of C-suite women around the world. And, you know, we knew they were out there. Um, they now are, I really hope, more connected to FIDIC because they're, you know, as a general rule, they're extremely impressive. The talent pool is there. We want to encourage them as much as we can to get involved with FIDIC, get on the committees uh, and put their hats in the ring for, uh, for running for, for board. And that's the step uh, for sure. Uh, and I, I, it's going to happen uh, without a doubt. The uh, pictures on that wall have to change, the ones that I referred to before. Thank you very much, Bill. I believe Michelle is back on. I'm going to hand over to Michelle for the next five minutes. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nelson. Apologies for that. Uh, previously, I indicated technology will keep you humble, and it has. <laughs> uh, we have a question. Um, when it comes to African and most third world countries, diversity and inclusion must be supported upon by engineering institutes and government policies. What's your opinion on this? And I'm going to maybe ask uh, uh, Charlotte if she can come in here, maybe opinion from the World Bank. Well, well thank you very much. I mean, I think it, as many speakers have, have indicated, Michelle, context is really important. And I think it's coming through as well by way of the poll, where there is the sense that understanding your regional context is also very important. Um, that said, I do think, you know, in order for us to think about having diversity inclusion within the engineering um, sector, we really need to invest in um, education. And, you know, I made this point in relation to persons with disabilities. But I think it, it's, it's, for, it's across the sector. Um, and here the idea is not only to invest in primary school, which is often the first port of call, but to ensure that investments are happening um, in tertiary education and that um, you know, persons, uh, that people are able then to get the necessary training and that there's a very deliberate emphasis on ensuring that that, that is diverse. For me, that's really important because um, unlike, unlike women, we don't necessarily have a pipeline of persons with disabilities, for example. And so it is important for us to start with looking at that aspect. How do we ensure that we have the pool to draw, to draw from to begin with? And then I think it's really important, whether it's in the context of Africa or somewhere else, is to ensure that we really build on the issues around um, social behavior, right? Because people need to feel accepted in, in, in the workspaces that they do. Um, and I think that that's really an important aspect going forward. So how to ensure that the workplace is inclusive and it takes into account the specificities of that given uh, country and or region. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I'm going to encourage all the listeners to please still carry on posting questions. We've now come to the end of the Q&A session, but all your questions will support us in the development of the FIDIC diversity and inclusion policy. So from here on, I'm gonna hand over to Bill for closing remarks. Thanks, Bill. Bill, can you unmute? 
Yes, I'm sorry. Um, thank, thank you uh, very much, Michelle. And uh, well, wow, once again, a fantastic uh, webinar hitting on uh, uh, all sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, timely subtopics within this very, very important topic. Uh, by the way, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, because I got a screen saying unmute myself. I don't know what that means. So um, anyway, just uh, I took a whole bunch of notes on this. It's just a great presentations. Um, one of the things that struck me uh, actually uh, has a little bit, not a lot to do with diversity, but uh, I think Katrina mentioned that 60% uh, of those with engineering degrees uh, stay in engineering and, and pursue other the other 40% pursue other um, other occupations. Uh, it's kind of depressing what I'm about to say because I think that was going on when I was graduating from college as well. And I think one of the reasons is that companies like to find engineers, even if they're not engineering companies, because engineers are trained to think. Uh, not that I don't know what else thinks, but but they're really given a thorough training in, in putting things together, solving problems and that kind of thing. So I think we'll always be faced with that. But on top of it, from a diversity standpoint, we have that problem of people in their 30s leaving the profession. Maybe it's family issues, maybe it's, uh, it's other reasons, I don't know, but we constantly need to to look at that and make, make life as easy as we can for those with other obligations when they're in their 30s and 40s to keep them involved with our firms because when perhaps some of those issues that are driving them away for a while might go away um, in the future and you want them back. And I know that's, that's something that our company, uh, CDM, uh, spent a lot of effort on and I think with some degree of success, uh, be, being as flexible as possible to allow people, regardless of gender or race, that run into an issue that uh, may be temporary for a number of years, but keep them involved because they'll they'll likely come back when uh, when that situation um, changes. So um, we also talked about the um, the amount of work left to be done. Uh, I absolutely applaud um, the nominating committee for setting a hard goal of 50% uh, gender diversity uh, on the board. And uh, I hope we, we meet that. I think we have a lot of things in place uh, to make that happen. Um, and, and not the least of which are the people that we've heard from today and who are on this diversity inclusion committee. So thank you so much for all these presentations and all the work that you do. And I think back to you now, Nelson. Thank you very much, Bill. Thanks for that. And we've been so delighted to have all the speakers. Um, we had a conversation from Charlotte. Uh, she focused very much on disability, which is very critical. And she tasked us that we need to look at it from different perspective. And we need to look at the life cycle. We need to look at the pipeline. We look at total talent management process. This is absolutely impossible, very important. Uh, and I think for me, uh, where, you know, in my role as a you know, board on the transport for London, it's always important when you look at as an engineer, how do you design for disabled people? How do you create opportunity within the company? So this is a very, very important point that she raised. Uh, Katrina raised the issue of Australian example. What I like most, apart from the mentoring, and the sort of uh, you know sort of sponsorship that she talked about, he said we need to address the cultural and systemic issue, and where you have hundred billion investment, what would be better to actually get the client to make sure diversity and inclusion is embedded in the process of procurement. Retention is absolutely critical. I then hear you know a comment from. Catherine, uh, I think it's wonderful that we have you within our board, uh, the first person within the company uh, to be a shareholder and a female. It's interesting to hear the fantastic example that your company is pursuing, and I would love to document that because it would be interesting to see how other companies, you know, compare with that. Uh, Joe talks about, you know, the FIDIC policy document, which is coming through the pipeline, and he did encourage that we are very much in the early phase, and we welcome the idea of contribution or suggestion to that. But what I also pick up in the key message was looking at the issue about the topics that I intend to cover. 
I'm understand from the point of view of the issue about embracing difference and treating people equally, looking at the subject of sustainability and how that's been woven into the process that is very encouraging. You talk about the mechanism that has been put out, which is looking at it from the issue of organization structure, which means charity begins at home. As FIDIC, we need to have a policy. We need to practice what we preach. We talked about the DNI being actually being built into regional issue and recognize regional diversity. You also talk about the project delivery. How do we embrace within project delivery? The themes that you talked about, gender, ethnics, and religions are absolutely critical. And I also take the five points you raised about education, engagement, employment, social retention, and social responsibility. All these points are absolutely essential. I think we've learned a lot. I'm sure that Andy is going to capture as much as possible. At this point in time, I just want to say thank you to all the speaker from Charlotte from World Bank to Catherine from uh, Australia, from Catherine from uh, you know Canada, uh, Joe from actually Netherlands, Bill who is being supporting us from the beginning of this program. Thank you very much for your presidency, and more important, Michelle who chaired the Diversity and Inclusion Group. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you to all our staff who are backing us. Talking from Barbara, Andy, and the rest of it, and Chanel, and all those who are working behind the scene to make sure this program is successful. On this point, I want to say thank you to all the participants, wherever you are. Keep safe and take care. God bless. Thank you.